So welcome again. So just by way of a little bit of background, over the last few years, Italy has proposed a series of tax reforms intended to close their substantial VAT gap. At the beginning of this year, Italy finalized their plans to impose a significant new compliance obligation on businesses selling in Italy, B2B e-invoicing. Later this year, the Italian Revenue Agency is expected to begin publishing the necessary technical specifications. Businesses will need to deploy solutions to comply with this new requirement and should do so with an eye to the future. The mandate will come into effect for some businesses by the 1st of July 2018 and will be enforced for all businesses by January the 1st 2019. Today, to help us, uh, with us to help us unpack some of the issues surrounding the introduction of this new mandate, we have Brendan McGoran, Regulatory Counsel at Sovos, specialising in internal, international taxation with a focus on value-added tax systems in the European Union. Brendan received his BA and JD from Washington University in St. Louis and is licensed to practice in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. He is joined by Ratty, Randy Satterfield, Group Project Product Manager for the Business to Government Division of Reporting Solutions at Sovos. Randy leverages more than 10 years experience in product development and management in multiple technology companies and has an MBA from Georgia Institute of Technology. He sets the strategy to develop software and service offerings that help to keep our customers compliant throughout the world. Brendan and Randy will answer some of the most frequently asked questions about the mandate and you will have the opportunity to pose your own questions via the interface on the right of your screen. We will aim to answer as many as time allows today and any questions we don't have time to answer will be answered personally after the session. The first question, Randy and Brendan, that we receive often is about the summary of VAT declarations and communications in place in Italy. Could you please clarify what these are exactly? Thank you for that introduction, Julian. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Brendan McGarn. Um, in terms of the VAT declarations and communications in Italy, today there are several, uh, which we have outlined on the screen for you. You have the annual VAT return, as well as the basic VAT return, periodic VAT payments, the intra-community purchase declarations 12 and 13, interstat summary lists, the membership declaration and group VAT changes, the VAT statement 74 BIS 2018, Declaration of Intent, Tax Deposits that Guarantee the Constitution for Fuel Extraction, and VAT Deposits for the Declaration Replacing the Liability Requirements and Warranty Provision. Now, if you notice on the screen, uh, we have a, a graph with two dimensions, one demonstrating complexity of process, another demonstrating tax authorities control. In the first quadrant, where we have the majority of Italy's forms, we are going from what we call reporting to e-filing. Reporting is the traditional paper VAT returns, which require aggregated data. E-filing is the next step in that progression, where you use standardized electronic formats, such as XML, combined with online communication protocols, such as web services, for filing periodic or detailed tax-related reports and returns. The next step in that curve is what we call the trans transactional data. This is commonly seen in things such as uh, e-accounting, where um, in other countries you see mandates such as SAFT or standard audit file for tax. Um, commonly this includes things such as uh, financial data, sales purchase, customer, vendor, materials, capital assets, or banking details. Traditionally a single tax ID is periodically or on request required to be submitted um, through an accounting or other source data to support the filings together with any master file data for customers and suppliers. Now in Italy, currently the Specimetro is the main way that that information is sent in an e-accounting manner, and that is the annual declaration to the tax offices of all domestic VAT sales and purchases. This is in addition to what is under e-filing for Interstat and European sales listings. Uh, Italy currently only has a combined Interstat. It does not do a separate European sales listing. However, uh, and we'll touch on this later, the Specimetro will be abolished starting in 2019 as Italy shifts to an e-invoicing mandate. You see here uh, cross-border communication under new, which is a form that is to be revealed later this year, but it will capture basically transactions from resident or established taxpayers in Italy that have data relating to the supply of goods and services provided or received to or from parties that are not VAT established or VAT registered in Italy. 
So this is information that would not be sent through the Sistema de Interscambio or the Italian exchange system because it's cross-border. Um, we'll get into the details later about the domestic uh, B2B mandate, which is going to capture that other data, but the cross-border communication combined with the e-invoicing mandate will basically provide the Italian tax authorities with all the invoices that are issued by parties. The final part of the curve uh, is real-time reporting. And this is where we get into the e-invoicing mandate, which we will explain throughout the presentation. E-receipt is a phenomenon that is not in Italy, but we have seen in other parts of the world, such as Latin America. Um, it's the electronic registration of the final consumer invoice transactions carrying VAT obligations, such as a gateway to e-receipt for fiscal printers. Thank you ever so much. And can you also please expand on precisely what e-invoicing is, please? Yes, so uh, if you look at this next slide, we have kind of the evolution of e-invoicing in Italy. So initially, Italy rolled out in 2014 business to government electronic invoicing where public administrators and government office suppliers uh, required that any uh, invoices submitted to them had to be uh, uh, mandatorily electronically invoiced through specific requirements relating to their exchange system. That led to uh, a test network that was established in July of 2016, where Italy began to allow businesses to experiment with the creation, transmission, and retention of electronic B2B invoices. Uh, in January 1st of 2017, Italy then introduced optional electronic invoicing for B2B transactions. Uh, this was a way for them to try and bring in certain entities with different tax incentives. So this included uh, reporting obligations being reduced, such as uh, you no longer had to complete the Specimetro, Interest Ad, or Blacklist reports. There was accelerated repayment for any VAT credit due for a refund. Uh, a reduction of one year in the statute of limitations for VAT collections, and there was the ability for the tax authorities to carry out remote audit checks, which lowered the interference that would normally happen when the government has to audit a uh, taxpayer's business operations. Then uh, in August of 2017, the Specimetro went into effect, and it was basically the stopgap until uh, what you see under the January 1, 2019, where they plan to abolish the best metro. Uh, in between is where the beginning of this mandate is going to take effect. So if you look at July 1, 2018 on the timeline, uh, that is where B2B electronic invoicing will become mandatory for public subcontract sector, as well as for sales of petrol or diesel fuel that is intended for use as motor fuel support. So that is a dramatic shift where beginning in real time, essentially, but by uh, midnight of the same day, these invoices must be submitted to the government through the Sistema de Interscambio, which is, again, the exchange system for the Italian Revenue Agency. Um, if you look at the final end of the timeline for January 1, 2019, there are several things that will go into effect. Uh, B2B resident transactions will be required to be submitted through the electronic invoicing system. Again, on the same timeline as before, um, I think the next slide actually will give a little bit better of an overview. Um, so you can see the who needs to comply, but this is basically all for the final aspects of that timeline. So this is all for the 20, uh, sorry, I'll move the mouse. This is all for the 2018 July and the January 1, 2019. So who needs to comply? It's going to be for resident, established, or identified for VAT purposes taxpayers in Italy. The phase one, again, this is the July 1, 2018. It'll be for the petrol or diesel fuel fly for engine suppliers and subcontractors under public service contracts. And then the phase two for January 1, 2019 will be the B2B suppliers of goods and taxable services, as well as B2C invoices, but only if the electronic invoice is required. So the consumer has the choice of taking a paper invoice. If they specifically request an electronic invoice 
then it must be submitted through the exchange. Uh, you'll notice for uh, under the second section, when it needs to be reported, there is an automatic approval process if the other party to the transaction, so in a B2B case, the business, or in a B2C case, the consumer, does not approve the invoice within 15 days, the government treats it as if it was accepted. Um, again, we touched on the what, but businesses will be submitting their invoices through the Sistema de Interscambio. How the information is delivered. The supplier's invoices must be sent in the XML format defined by the Italian tax authority, Futura PA XML, and be signed by a certified trust provider to the SDI. The SDI will then deliver the invoice to the buyer. The buyer has the option to reject the invoice, and depending on the data exchange setup, the supplier may need to respond to such a rejection. Again, uh, we'll touch on this a little later, but there are several transmission channels for how information can be exchanged between the parties. Now, the why you have to comply with the consequences of non-compliance. Uh, there is a penalty for failing to issue an invoice or issue an invoice that does not meet the XML format. And it ranges from 90 to 180% of the VAT that is not correctly documented. Again, for the clients who do not receive the purchase invoice according to the requirements mentioned above. So if you are a business or a customer that receives an invoice that is in the incorrect format, you also have obligations. And in order to avoid the penalties provided for, um, which essentially are equal to 100% of the VAT not documented, you have to comply with the format requirements through the use of the SDI. So there is an onus on both the one issuing and the one receiving the electronic invoice to make sure that they're in the correct format. So, so why is Italy moving towards mandatory e-invoicing? Uh, that's a great question, Julian. So if you look at the history of Italy and you look at it relative to other countries, you can see that uh, together the UK, Germany, France, and Italy represent almost two thirds of the total VAT gap. Um, however, Romania, Slovakia, Greece, Lithuania, and Italy are the ones that collect less VAT revenue in terms of overall percentage. You can kind of see through this chart how Italy is at quite a, uh, it's quite an anomaly compared to other countries in terms of the you know absolute value of VAT gap, but also relative terms to GDP. So with this dire revenue situation where they have a lot of VAT gap, which is basically the estimated difference between anticipated VAT revenue versus actual receipts, it is uh, at the forefront of the efforts to help implement technology solutions to help tackle this VAT fraud. If you were to summarize the reasons for moving to mandatory invoicing, I would say primarily it's around reducing the VAT gap, combating fraud and evasion, as well as in terms of simplification of tax collection. By moving to e-invoicing, they can carry out timely and automatic checks of the consistency between the VAT declared and paid, and it provides the grounds to be prepared. Well, it takes advantage of the existing voluntary system and uh, the previous B2G system that was in place. So there should be a smooth transition relative to another regime that might try and just go straight to B2B invoicing, and in which they hope it will limit the impact of the measure on taxable persons and consumers. Uh, can I go on to ask, how, how exactly does e-invoicing work though? Sure. Um, this next slide will show the process. So if you were to begin with a transaction, you would have a seller send an e-invoice uh, into their billing system. From there, it would be converted uh, through software, either in-house or by an intermediary, into the appropriate XML format according to the technical specifications declared by the Italian government. That format is used to send the information to uh, the public administration. So in this case, it would be uh, you can see here the Agencia del Entrate, but there are several ways uh, the invoice would need to be sent. Before this invoice is sent through the vehicle though, there are two key things that must happen. 
The invoice must be signed with a qualified or digital signature, which is currently defined by the Europe, European EIDAS regulation, and it must be sent to the counterparty. So how it is sent to the counterparty, there are five different transmission channels. It could be sent through web, it could be sent through certified electronic mail, SBC Coop service, SDI Coop service, or SDI FTP service. That transmission must happen by midnight of the day that the invoice was issued. When the, is when the invoice is sent through that transmission channel to the SDI, they will assign it a unique office code. From there, they will send it, if it was for a government purchase, they'll send it to the government billing system. If it was sent for a business, it will go through the intermediary and they will have 15 days to accept or reject. If a rejection is sent, it will trigger a message that is sent back through the uh, Sistema de Interscambio, notifying the seller of the rejection. If it is accepted, it will be marked as accepted and valid within both uh, ERP systems. The Italian Revenue Agency has not yet worked out the details of what will happen with rejections in terms of how they are communicated. It is uh, one of several key details that is to be further defined by later guidance. Um, unfortunately, and we'll talk about this a little later, the election process in Italy has held up a lot of government functions such that timely guidance has been delayed. And Brendan, um, I would just add one point on, on this when you look at that last slide is, you know, for those of us who are coming from an IT background, um, you know, this is a really this is a really complex system that we we have to sort of encounter. And as Brendan said, some of the information is not yet fully fleshed out in terms of the decisions that we have to make in terms of handling these invoices with the acceptance and rejections. So it's uh, very clearly, um, you know, a place where, you know, if you're in the in the IT world, you, you may want to think about having a partner for, for this sort of challenge. Um, because there are certainly um, quite a few complexities in terms of creating these XMLs, signing them, sending them, receiving a, uh, an acceptance or rejection back, um, and and basically interacting with the with the local government there in Italy. So, um, just food for thought for those of us that come from that space. And one more thing, Randy, you actually reminded me of. If you see the top right corner of this slide, you'll notice that there's a ten for archiving uh, under Italy's laws. Uh, these electronic records are supposed to be kept and archived for up to 10 years. Now, under the budget bill that was passed that enabled electronic invoicing to be mandatory in Italy, they have stated that transmission of the invoice through the SDI will satisfy archiving requirements, but they have not indicated if it will satisfy archiving requirements under other civil laws because there are several different regimes that govern the tracking and securing of invoiced information. And it has also not clarified where data will reside because under the former guidance, when the system was just B to G, it was always between a business and a government and the governmental entity on the end would have the responsibility of siloing that information. Now the transactions will be happening B2B, that's another area to look for in terms of further clarification from the Italian government. So, so you mentioned the elections in Italy. Um, do you actually think there's any chance that the start date for e-invoicing in Italy will be postponed? Um, that is a, that's a complex question. And I think there are three kind of main things at play. Um, one is the Italian law process, which you can see outlined here. But from the Italian law process, things are relatively straightforward. So, you know, uh, earlier this year in October, they introduced the bill. By November, the House of the Senate had approved it. In December, the chamber in the Senate had approved the modified version from the House. The president signed off and it was published in the official gazette. Now, while that was happening, Italy is a member of the EU. so they cannot act unilaterally when they are trying to change certain VAT policy because they are bound by what's called the EU VAT directive. So they posed a request for authorization for derogation from the EU VAT directive uh, in September of this year, which was forwarded to the European Commission, who then has made a recommendation 
as of February of 2018 for the European Council to consider in Italy's favor a derogation. Now, what exactly are they asking for a derogation for? Uh, this next slide will answer some of that. So, as a member state, Italy is legally bound to respect the requirements of the EU VAT directive. As currently written, the Italy proposal violates the EU directive in two important ways. The first is buyer's consent. So the VAT directive states that the supplier must obtain the buyer's consent before substitution, substituting an electronic invoice for a paper invoice. By Italy requiring businesses to issue electronic invoices, they effectively eliminate the right of the buyers and the buyers cannot say, hey, I want paper or electronic. The second is the freedom to choose a document format. So the VAT directive provides trading partners the right to choose the format through which they exchange electronic invoices. The Italian proposal requires businesses to adopt a single very specific format for how invoices will be submitted and that eliminates that right. Now the EU VAT directive does allow for member states to be authorized to derogate from the common VAT rules but it's for simplifying procedures for charging the tax or to prevent certain types of tax evasion or avoidance. Now, if you remember earlier in the presentation when I showed how dramatic Italy's VAT gap was in comparison to other EU members, that is something that you know uh, has been helping Italy in its application for derogation. So when an EU member state proposes a law that violates an EU directive, the proper recourse is for them is to submit the request for the derogation. So as I mentioned in September, they made the formal request to the European Commission, specifically from Article 218 and 232. So 218 again is member states shall accept documents or messages on paper or electronic. They only want to be electronic form. Article 232 is the use of electronic invoice shall be subject to acceptance by the recipient. Now, again, that is uh, Italy basically imposing the format. Um, this request that they submitted would be specifically from July 1, 2018, which if you remember, that is the date when B2B invoicing becomes mandatory for subcontractors and the supply of diesel or petrol fuel for use in motor vehicles until December 31st, 2021. Uh, the next key date was on November 7th, the European Commission informed all other member states in the EU of what Italy was trying to do, and they notified Italy that they would then dig in and consider the request. Uh, as mentioned, on February 5th, the European Commission submitted their Italy's request as a legislative proposal to the European Parliament, and they recommended that Italy's request be approved. Now, the derogation process has a lot of permutations, but I've tried to outline the steps. Um, you'll see through the next several slides. So, the process begins with the Commission proposal. So, this is what happened uh, on February 5th when uh, the European Commission submitted on behalf of Italy the request to the European Parliament. Now from there, the European Parliament has the option to examine the proposal and they can either adopt or amend it. Now uh, from there, if it is adopted or amended, it goes to the Council of the European Union who then decide if they want to adopt or amend. From there, it goes back to the parliament for a second reading where they can approve it, in which case it's approved and that would be binding, or they can reject it, in which case it doesn't enter into force, or they propose an amendment, in which case it goes back to a second reading in the council. The council then would examine the parliament's second reading position and they would either approve, in which case the act is adopted, or they don't approve, which will lead to the convening of the conciliation committee. Now, conciliation committee, which is composed of an equal member of MEPs and council representatives, tries to reach an agreement on a joint text. If they're unsuccessful, the legislative act will not enter into force and the procedure is ended. If a joint text is agreed to, it's forwarded to the European Parliament and Council for a third reading. And during this third reading, the Parliament <laughs> reads the joint text and votes in plenary. They are not allowed to make any amendments at this process. They either have to accept or reject. If they 
reject or fail to act on it, the act is not adopted and the procedure ends. If it's approved by Parliament and Council, the act is adopted. The Council likewise looks at it. So those are basically happening in parallel. There are a lot of permutations and moving parts there, but as you can see, Italy is just at phase two of this process. So, you know, a lot of moving pieces ahead. The last thing compounding, uh, will the e-invoicing PA start date be postponed, is Italy itself. So in the background of them passing the law and the derogation issues in the EU, Italy held its own elections on March 4th, 2018. However, none of the parties were able to achieve an absolute majority. The three main parties are the anti-establishment five-star movement, the center-right alliance, which is composed of Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia, Matteo Salvini's Lega Nord, and the Brothers of Italy, and then the incumbent Democratic Party. Since then, there have been two rounds of formal consultations between Italy's president, Sergio Mattarella, and the party. However, the formal consultations have failed to break the stalemate. Earlier today, Italy's president, Sergio Mattarella, asked the parliamentary leader, Maria Castellati, the newly elected Senate president, to mediate among party chiefs in an attempt to form a government supported by both the Five Star Movement and the Center Right Alliance, hoping a neutral figure can break the stalemate that's persisted since Mark's election. So for about the past five weeks, Italy has been ruled by what's called a caretaker government. You know, in that absence, they've only been uh, issuing kind of functions that allow the state to operate at a minimal level. And so it is going to be key for Italy to resolve its own internal issues, as well as the EU derogation issues to be resolved favorably. If both of those things happen, the timeline will continue as scheduled. If not, it's anyone's guess as to what happens next. Thank you. So we've got um, a very limited time left, but uh, time for a couple of questions from our audience here. Um, the first one that's come through um, is uh, asking if Sobos are supporting e-invoicing in Italy. Yeah, hi, this is Randy. I can field that one. So yes, we're definitely supporting uh, electronic invoicing in Italy and we've uh, developed a solution there and we're in the process of, of testing it now with some partners um, in, the, in the local market. Um, and we will be ready well ahead of the deadline with, uh, with our solution. Super, thank you. And next question that's come in, um, is e-invoicing mandatory for e-commerce transactions to final consumers? I can, I can take that one. Um, in principle, no, unless the customer requires an invoice or the supplier issues voluntarily an invoice. Um, however, that is, again, one of the many things that the tax authorities may provide guidance to in this respect. Um, so again, Sovos will be monitoring for any further communications from the Italian government. Thank you. And I think we've got time for just one more. Um, and that is, uh, will B2C invoices also be forwarded by the Italian tax authorities to the customer? Um, I can take that again. And yes, they, they will be forwarded by the Italian tax authorities to the customer. However, it is also not clear how those e-invoices will be transmitted to consumers um, is likely to involve uh, PEC or CEM is how it's referred to in English that's certified electronic mail however we do not yet know and await further guidance from the Italian tax authorities okay thank you very much indeed both to Randy and Brendan I'm afraid we have run out of time this afternoon for any further questions but as I said at the uh, the beginning of the presentation uh, we will be in touch with you personally um, if we haven't managed to answer any of your questions this afternoon um, also wanted to thank you for your kind comments that have been coming through and just to let you know that yes this presentation will be available as a recording uh, later um, before we close today and say goodbye, I'd just like to run through the ways that you can get in touch with us at Sovos. You can obviously um, get help by visiting our website, which is a wealth, contains a wealth of information uh, about uh, 